Hey, Sidey Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Happy Thursday, best day of the week. So we're gonna keep our uh, theme on education today. Yesterday we talked about, uh, well, I kind of outlined, there's two different paths here. You have Marxism and postmodernism in our, in our school system today. So the Marxist approach is to infuse all lesson plans with Marxist ideology, and that's what I'm gonna prove today. The other path is the postmodern approach and there's obviously overlap here, but the postmodern approach is, is, what is math? <laughs> what are numbers really? You say two plus two equals four, but I, I, do you really know that? Can you really know anything, right? It's like this new HUE thing, right? So those are the two different paths. Uh, and yesterday we talked about the, the evolution, the de-evolution to how we got here. And you can check that out on our uh, app, on, on the, in the app stores. Search for the first TV and you can watch all of our, our classic shows. Uh, but let's talk about Marxism today. I found a copy of a textbook called Rethinking Mathematics, Teaching Social Justice by the Numbers. This is a uh, math textbook uh, for teachers, like lesson plans for teachers to bring into the classroom. Okay? So here are the, uh, the chapters here. Because you think, what is, what is social justice math? Like, what could that, what could that even possibly be? Uh, here's some dynamics, uh, some uh, chapters. Home buying while black or brown. Uh, in this uh, chapter, kids are to develop an understanding of the socio-political, cultural, economic, and historical dynamics of racism, along with their interconnections. Uh, living algebra, living wage. One section, I can't survive on 825, using math to investigate minimum wage and CEO pay. So you can see it's just gonna be a whole wealth envy thing there. Uh, sweatshop accounting, globalization, labor, and the environment. There's a ton of environmentalism stuff in here. Uh, another chapter, when equal isn't fair, racism and stop and frisk, the square root of a fair share, the geometry of inequality, right? And that's about redlining. So we're going to teach geography or, or uh, geometry by, by teaching how redlining uh, kept, kept people down. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, plot, this is a good one. Uh, math, maps, and misrepresentation. M misrepresentation. So one of the teaching suggestions in this section is to ma uh, map the territory that Mexico lost to the United States. Okay, so we're going to teach about maps, and how are we going to do that? Well, here's the land that the white man stole from Mexico. That's how we're going to learn about maps. Um, here's the one. All right, this is the one I'm, I'm always going to use as the shorthand example. Like my go-to quick example, because I think this one best characterizes what this is. This is the chapter. Write the truth, presidents and slaves. And it's a whole chapter on, on uh, how our presidents were, were slave owners. In a math textbook, and you, and you calculate what percentage of our presidents were slave owners, aren't we a horrible country? What are right, so you see the, the infusion of, of social justice and really Marxism into math class. <laughs> I, I, we get it. I get it for the infusion of Marxism in history class. Like, I get that. That makes sense. How they could do that and why they'd want to do that. But math, why, what are you doing that with math for? Well, you got to take everything down. We're not teaching math for its own sake. We're not teaching math. For, and, and so this is how they frame it, too. They're like, well, we got to make math relevant. We got to make math relevant for the kids and their lives and their stories. Right? So it's like, okay, we can make math relevant. Like, let's teach math and we'll teach kids like the math required to build a bridge or to calculate physics equations or we can, here, here's, let's study the Parthenon and we can talk about the golden mean and how the Parthenon was built entirely using the mathematical reality of what the golden mean is and how that's beautiful to the eyes, of, right? Like there's all this practical stuff you can do with math. It doesn't have to be, oh, we gotta make math practical. Let's talk about racism and slavery and how capitalism's awful and the white man stole Mexican land, right? Like, that doesn't have to be the only, like, applicable thing in kids' lives. Okay, so I got a, uh, here's an actual lesson suggestion that they give. So, uh, teachers give uh, kids or groups of kids maps of the world, right? So everyone gets, like, a world map. Right? And you get 25 chips. And each kid, or, or groups of kids, stack the chips based on where they think people live, right? So we're gonna, where do, you, where do you think all the people are based on your 25 chips, right? So the kids would put, I don't know, like a lot of, a lot of chips in America and a lot in Africa and Australia, whatever. Right? 
And then the kids do that, and then afterwards the teacher says, oh, here's the reality. Here's the fact of where people live. Most live in China, then India, then America. There's the top three. Okay, fine. Then you get another 25 chips. So you have the chips stacked up based on where people live, and then you have another 25 chips, and this is where the kids, uh, you're supposed to stack the chips, distribute the chips, where you, based on GDP, where the money is. And kids are like, oh, well, here's the population, so that must be the most money. And, whatever. and then they map with them. And then you show the kids the truth with, with uh, re who really has the most money. Okay, here's, and here's the, this is what we're supposed to do after. Math class. Right? Reflect on the sizes of the two different sets of chip stacks representing population and resources. Bring the students back together for a whole class discussion. Show students the information from the world chart. Connect here. Connect their emotions and feelings of fairness to the information on the chart. Their emotions. Their emotions and feelings of fairness in math class. And then we have some questions here for the kids. Should wealth be distributed equally? Now, mind you, there's going to be no conversation on, like, why America has such a big stack of wealth, right? There's, there's going to be no celebration of capitalism and perspective on, on how world poverty has just plummeted in the last hundred years in the countries that have embraced capitalism. There's going to be no perspective there. It's a Marxism class, right? So should wealth be distributed equally? Uh, who do you think decides how wealth is distributed? Now, the good news is in a capitalist system, no one decides. But from the Marxist framework, there's always got to be someone deciding. And we need someone more righteous to decide instead, like in the Soviet Union. Uh, how does the unequal distribution of wealth affect the power that groups of people hold? It's all about power to these Marxists. Ask them uh, what role they think colonialism played in creating this inequality. Right? So this has to be the white man's fault. The, the unequal distribution of money has to be white people's fault, colonial's fault. And here's the most important part. After the discussion in math class, have students write an essay about their feelings. Some students might also make wall posters that graphically depict the inequality of wealth and how they feel. This is great. So you can, uh, you can write an essay or make a poster. Now, this is the thing from these people. Writing, they believe, is a white man's master's tool they call it worship of the written word. So to ask students of color to write an essay is a tool of oppression upon the oppressed. So instead, they can just make posters about how they feel in math. Okay, That's the entire textbook, is nonsense like that. That's just, I randomly just picked that one. I, I didn't like go through them all and find the worst one. Every single lesson is that for the entire textbook. There's your math class for the day. So you're dropping your kids off inside that building thinking that they're learning math <laughs> and instead the entire goal is to get your kids to leave the classroom with a feeling that things are unfair and the system's unfair and, and heaven forbid you're white and you're complicit in that unfairness and if you're, if you're a person, a student of color then, then you're a victim of this unfairness and it's all about feelings and of course it's about feelings because there is no reason or logic or even reality at all. You're left only with feelings. It's the only tool that a postmodernist Marxist has at their disposal is feelings. That's why math class is all about your feelings. I'm, I, I can't express this enough. If you, are, if you drop your kids off in that building that we call the local public school, you are out of your mind you're absolutely out of your mind. Now, I know it's weird in a COVID world, we're not, like in California, we can't drop your kids off, so there's no school. But if you still let them zoom into this cult, you're out of your mind. There's no excuse. There's no excuse for it. I had a teacher calling on my radio show yesterday, former teacher. She's like, Slater, sweet lady, Slater, you're, you're, way, you're way overblowing this. I was a teacher for 30 years, and we never, we, we did a whole segment, actually we talked to James Lindsay from newdiscourses.com on the radio, and, um, we did a whole thing on, we did the postmodern aspect of this, which is two plus two equals four. Well, who are you to say? What is four? That's on a base 10 number system, but on a base three number system, it's 11. And the Aztecs calculated numbers like this, and their perspective of narrative of numbers was blah, 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 blah. That's the postmodern thing, right? Just to muddy the waters and confuse you and still always bring it back to the white man and how they're oppressive, whatever. And she's like, Slater, we never taught this. I never taught this in my 30 years. 
And with all due respect to this, I'm sure, wonderful teacher, things are different today than they've been in the last 30 years. I went to a good public school, and my education was, it was just like neutrally bad. <laughs> I, was just, I just didn't learn anything. I remember my senior year, I had like six study halls. I got so good at, at spoons and, and uh, it was like, like these other card games. We just played cards all day. We didn't do anything. So that was like, like neutral. But my school wasn't actively Marxist. It was like my, my public school wasn't a pure indoctrination camp like they are today. And, and things have changed in the last 30 years, man. This is all in the curriculum now, right? The 1619 Project, it's taught in thousands of schools across the country in, in almost every state. Seattle just released their uh, K through 12 math framework, which is blatantly Marxist. Just, it's entirely oppressor versus oppressed narrative. This is the official, like this is in. This is, this, is, this is from the top down, agreed upon. You can't send your kids to these places anymore. It's off the table. And that's the thing, it's, my point is, it's different than when you were in school. You can't send your kids there. What's more important than your kid's education? Think about it like this. Let's say you want your, your, kids, uh, your kid's good at baseball, right? So you're like, oh, I'm gonna send my kid to uh, the new modern uh, baseball academy over here. And you drop them off, and you find out later that all they do at this baseball academy is teach how awful baseball is and how it's a terrible, stupid sport. And instead of throwing the ball overhand, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna kick it and we're gonna run backwards and sports are the white man's tool of oppression, right? Like you would stop sending your kid to that baseball academy. You're handicapping them. You're, what do you say? So they're not gonna get better at baseball at the place that teaches that baseball is an evil. And just look at it now. What's the fruit of our public education system already? You want your kids wrapped up in that? I can't express it enough. It's a thousand times worse than you were than when you were in school. There's no comparison. Uh, I'll take a break. I want to play a clip of uh, one of these postmodernists, just so you can get a full appreciation for how wacky these people are, and again, how much power they have. And then uh, we're talking a little bit about Thomas Sowell's new book about charter schools and how the teachers' union want all the teachers unions want to get rid of charter schools because they don't want to give you a, a way to escape, right? There's one way, there's two ways to escape. Well, three, I guess. You get homeschool, uh, private school, which is money, perhaps. There could be scholarships. Don't let the money keep you away without asking first, if, if, even if you're low income, if you can get into a private school with your kids. Uh, but then you have charter schools as well, which are free. And the, the teachers union are trying to get rid of that avenue to get you away from the Marxist camps. So we'll talk about that next. True story. Thanks later. Spread the word. Hey, Snyder Crusaders. Uh, coming up in the next segment, we're going to talk about uh, Herbert Marcuse. He's one of these uh, New Age Hui philosopher guys that has uh, had a huge impact on, on where we are right now today. So we'll do that coming up. But I want to just do one more quick segment on, uh, on math and how these people are just totally, completely out of their minds. And I think this video is a good representation of that. Enjoy. I, I carry this box of candies around when this idea of truth comes up. Mm -hmm. And some people do view it as binary and some people view it as something else. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, would a Native American or anyone else, would you perhaps even look at this box of candies and say that it can both be even an odd number of total pieces simultaneously? Well, How would you go about solving that question whether the total number of pieces in this box is either even or odd. Would you agree that it's one or the other? I, no, I wouldn't. Because, again, you're operating from different understandings. You can count them, we can count them as we know numbers to exist uh -huh. in a sequence. Yeah. We could count those and say there are definitely 35 pieces in there. Okay, great. The, in, the Aztecs had the Nepal Wan Sin Sin, which is an entirely different, entirely different understanding of how numbers work. Okay. <laughs> hey, you, you following? 
uh, different understanding of how a number, uh, to be clear, the question is even or odd, number of candies. Well, I mean, I mean, it depends. What's your understanding of how numbers work? And can we really even know how numbers work? I mean, look at the, the Aztecs. I mean, and their Nepawansin scene. No one has any idea what that word is, by the way. Uh, James Lindsay doesn't know what it is, as that was the guy there you saw in the side of it. No one knows what Nepawansin is. And we live here in San Diego. We're like an Aztec stolen land or whatever. Uh, so I, I'm going to, I meant to do it yesterday. I'm going to reach out to like an Aztec, like historical society and be like, what in the world is Nepawansin Sing? No one knows. I don't even think she knows. Actually, I'm certain she doesn't know based on the next clip we're going to play her. But uh, as we know, numbers do exist. Okay, so you say, so it's funny, people say, uh, you know, two plus two, like mocking these postmodernists, two plus two equals five. And it's not that two plus two equals five, it's, it's more, I say two plus two equals four, and they say, well, can you really know what it is? Here's a little more. That would go, it, it's almost like too advanced, to, I don't even get it, you know? Hmm. But I, there's this teacher um, at high school, um, who she doesn't just bring in Mexican American studies specifically um, for one lesson plan. She operates her entire curriculum based on um, Maya, Maya, yeah, Maya um, understandings of mathematics. To bring this to your definition of the word truth, then, how would you? How would you look at this box of candies? It's understandings of experience. It's understandings, um, yeah, it's understandings of experiences from perspectives. Like, it's not, is it true that the Europeans conquered this land? Yes. Is it true that they they came into Mexican territory and uh, completely disregarded a treaty? Yes, those things are true. But that's not the truth that we're taught in school. So you can ask any, you know, anyone who's not into these critical studies, what we know as truth is not true. It was, it's their narrative. Amazing. So her... Like, she can make truth statements, right? Her version of history is true. The white man, it's just, yeah, they say, she doesn't say, like, Spaniards came. It's, it's Europeans, right? You got to make it broader, all white people, right? So, so the white man came. That's true. But your truth of how many Tic Tacs are in this jar, well, we can't really know, you know? It depends on your understanding of experience from perspectives. <laughs> all right. That, that, that's, that's the main thing. It depends on what you experience from your perspectives on how many Tic Tacs are in that jar. But it's definitely true that Europeans came and stole Mexican land. That's definitely true. Now, what's really fascinating about this is, and this is what they do, it's a rhetorical trick, and James Lindsay talks about this a lot. They went from a very concrete, specific question. How many Tic Tacs are in this box, right? See how quickly she moved away from the box of Tic Tacs, which is a very clear and objective, simple statement? And now she's, she broadened it out into something that's way more complex and dynamic. It's civilization versus civilizations, right? So she a quick, in 20 seconds, she brought it from Tic Tacs to European conquering of lands. Right? You're like, what do you, whoa, how, why'd you do that? Well, she said, she changed the subject. Instead of this, we're going to talk about, instead, my vague and super complicated point so that I can make the argument that, you know, it's not as easy as you think, right? So once I can muddy the waters and get you to think that, A, we've been lied to, and B, things are more complicated, then they can make it small again and say, so therefore, who's really to say how many pieces of candy are in that little box? That is a rhetorical trick to win an argument. It's not an actual argument. Uh, Thomas Sowell has a new book. Man's 90 years old. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's about charter schools. And he has this great line in the beginning. He says, many people uh, had already made up their minds and did not want to be confused by facts. Or nepo uh, So 
Thomas Sowell, it, among other things, he looks at three schools in New York City. Now, studies like this are difficult because there's a lot of different variables that you got to control for. In this scenario, there are no different variables. Well, there's one. You have two public schools and a charter school in the same building. So same demographics, same community they draw from, same socioeconomic standings, everything's the exact same, except these, uh, except these kids, one goes to a charter school and the rest go to, to public schools. They're in the same building. All right, now let's look at some uh, test results here. We'll just do this really quick. And I will admit this font is small and my computer screen is far away from me, but I think you get the gist here. You have four levels, uh, one, two, three, four. One is well below proficient, four is above proficient. Uh, and the blue and the orange are the two public schools and the charter school is the gray. So you can see, this is math class. Uh, you can see there's n no one, no one in the public school are, it's like two or 3% a, a proficient and no one's above proficient. And in the charter schools, it's almost everybody is either proficient or above proficient. No difference whatsoever in the same building. It's just how they're being taught and, and no unions and how they're doing it. And we got another one here, same deal with uh, language arts. Same thing, right? Look at the blue and the orange, those are the public school kids. Look how many of them are well below proficient and below proficient. That is so sad versus the kids who are proficient and above proficient. Right? Um, and those are older numbers, right? Those are older numbers where they're just doing a bad job at teaching math and English. Now let's muddy the waters with the Aztecs, Nepawan, Sin Sin, and what are numbers, any, right? Think the kids are gonna do better now? The Success Academy uh, in New York City had 18,000 applications for 3,000 available seats, all right? That's a wait list of 14,000 families for the 2018 school year. 14,000 families who wanted to get out of that, that, that part of the building and go to a different part of the same building. That's how different things were. And I believe the first thing that Mayor de Blasio did in New York City was to uh, cancel, I think it was an already approved um, charter school expansion. And the first thing he did was take back that approval. The teachers union in LA, they sent out a list of demands for going back to school uh, with COVID. And they, like, a lot of them were COVID related. And then at the end they're like, oh, and by the way, we want to defund the police, Medicare for all, and we got to eliminate all charter schools. <laughs> because they don't want to give you a way out. They don't want you to go to even on the other side of the building where things are different and where they don't have power. Uh, I'm gonna take a break here because we got great guests, but let me just real quick, we'll end up with this curriculum here. This is uh, some anti-racist curriculum. This is Fairfax County, Virginia, but it's everywhere. Fairfax County is a big county. Um, and this is starting this fall. This is uh, K through five. Right. One of their points of essential knowledge is students will know that the United States was founded on, what do you think the United States was founded on? Well, that's just your previous way of understanding. Instead, it's founded on protecting the economic interests of white Christian men who owned property, and in the process, it protected the institution of slavery. Never providing any truth or even any nuance to that at all. America, no, America was a purely an economic interest, which is Marxism, right? by evil Christian men, religion is oppressive, also a Marxist thing, done to protect the institution of slavery. No mention at all that America was founded out of a unique set of enlightenment principles and set in motion a moral and political framework for ending this institution of slavery that has existed for all of time. This is an actual quote from, uh, from the guide, but this is for teachers. Teachers can allow students to apply critical lenses such as critical race theory and Marxist theory to the reading of news articles to allow students to think more deeply about who is being most affected and why. Okay. It's explicit. I know it's, not, it's not like, hey, everyone, I think there's, like, if you look real closely and squint, you may be able to see some kind of Marxist underpinnings here. Here it is right here. Teachers can allow students to apply Marxist theory. It's explicit. They're not hiding it anymore. So now it is entirely up to you if you care or not. True story. Mike Slater. Spread the word.
Hey, Snyder Crusaders. So I know we've been just like throwing crazy terms at you as, as we've been diving into this woke cult of, of critical theory and postmodernism and Marxism. But we, it's always worthy to take some time and kind of slow it down and, and talk about the root of these things and define our terms and all that stuff. And that's why I'm super grateful for Tyler Brandt. He's a senior associate editor at uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, which is obviously an incredible group. And he wrote this great article on Herbert Marcuse, which may be a name that you've uh, heard thrown around lately. Uh, Tyler, how are you, brother? Excellent this morning, Mike. How are you? Uh, really good, man. Glad you're here. Let's, uh, let's start as big as we can. What is postmodernism? Okay, all right. Well, starting as big as we can, I would say that postmodernism is essentially a new philosophy um, past modernism that essentially rejects all forms of objective truth. Okay. Like what and how so? So, for, for example, in the universities and uh, throughout academia, there has long been traditions of um, Plato and Socrates and other philosophers trying to discover things as they are and discovering objective truth. And I would say that this postmodern theory that has infected its way through academia essentially posits that we can't understand anything besides power struggles and besides uh, the oppressor versus the oppressed, more specifically. Okay, so I, I totally get it. We, so we just did two segments on uh, math and postmodernism and math. And like, well, what is math? What are numbers? Who are you to say? It's all about your different understandings as we know numbers to exist on your narrative of experience. <laughs> so, so that all sounds like a bunch of postmodern mumbo jumbo. So love that, and I totally get it. Where did it come from? And, and this is where we can introduce uh, Herbert Marcuse. Who's this cat? So Herbert Marcuse was, they call him the father of the new left, and uh, he was essentially the most prominent figure in what people call the Frankfurt School, which was um, a college in Germany that um, took critical theory and then essentially spread it to the masses. So if you want to go back and you want to ask where postmodernism came from, first it was from Immanuel Kant and his critical philosophy, and it's also mixed in with Hegel and uh, his dialectic essentially the master-slave dialectic, I think, is the most important thing to understand there. And based off of those two philosophies and Marx comes Herbert Marcuse and the School of Critical Theory from Frankfurt, Germany. All right, I love the mapping it out. So I'm reading the Thomas Sowell book on Karl Marx right now, and we did a bio on Karl Marx the other day, and his, he was in the Young Hegelians and his influence of, of Hegel. And so would you put, so you say Kant to Hegel to Marx to Marcuse? So I guess the question is, how much of Marx is in Marcuse's philosophy? Um, I would say a heavy portion of it. The funny thing about the critical theorists is that they're kind of gadflies in a way where they apply critical theory to everything, even Marxism. So Herbert Marcuse himself <laughs> wrote very strong critiques on Marx and Marxism, Leninism, but still I would say heavily inspired by Marx's works. So it's wild. What I don't understand is like, if, if the argument is you can't know truth, what do they say about themselves when it comes to what they're saying is true? That's a good question. And I don't know if they would posit it's true for them. It's a matter of experience um, through this dialectic power dynamics that you can understand. So between the oppressor and the oppressed, there is a conflict. And what we can observe is that conflict happening. We can't know truth through logical formulations. Rather, it's the conflict wherein we can draw these uh, inferences about reality and power dynamics from. Okay, can you give me a little? Can you give me a little more on that? What is what is that? I mean, dialectics is a crazy word. Uh, yes. So so what is dialectics and and as as I'm trying to understand these guys, I also want to ask you what what the truth is or or what what the philosophy was that they were arguing against that we've grown up thinking is true. Mm-hmm. Well, the philosophy so, so they were arguing yeah. against is traditionalism, in a sense, and that's very broad, so it'd be hard for me to break it down, but it's essentially dismantling all forms of philosophy, which the Western civilization has came to understand truth and draw inferences uh, from reality about. So it's just, it's just dismantling that whole traditional structure, in a sense. So can, can you know, do you believe we can know truth? Personally, I think we yeah. can get very close to it because I have a platonic view of truth. 
that is there is an objective truth that exists and as humans we do have certain cognitive biases but in breaking down those biases and understanding the formal study of logic we can get very close to objective truth i think mathematics is the biggest proof of that uh, so I so I love the because this is what I've learned about this postmodern Marxist stuff. There's like a little tiny, teeny tiny kernel of truth that they can right that they take and they blow it up. So you talked about uh, cognitive biases, and they take that to mean well your experience and narratives and and nothing is true, right? So right. I love how you like you, you account for that. Like oh no, there's biases, but you break those down, not the concept of truth itself, right? Right. That isn't to say there aren't power dynamics in play in society. It's just to say it's probably not as significant as critical theorists think it is. They blow it up to mean everything. And it's kind of like, you know, you give a kid a hammer and everything looks like a nail. You give a philosopher critical theory and they want to take critical theory and dismantle everything. Hmm. Um, Oh, good. We got a few more minutes. Okay. Um, We're doing good here, Mike. No, no, you're, you're, you're crushing it. So give me an example of something that a Marxist or a Hegelian or a Marcusean would see as a dialectic power struggle that you or I would look at and be like, oh no, that's that's not. <laughs> like that's that's not a power oppressed oppressor dynamic. Yeah, I think one easy example is just say um, boss and employee, right? I'm a cashier at Starbucks and my uh, my boss tells me make this drink, do this, be here at eight o'clock. And I see that as oppressive because there is an inherent um, power dynamic at play where I can't express myself, I can't do what I want to do just because of the structure that is. And where I would say being a capitalist and understanding that essentially labor and employee relations is a trade, I am not inferior because I am here on my own volition and I chose to be here. So I would say people view that as a power struggle, but in reality, what it is, it's an agreement between employer and employee. Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me throw one your way and see if you think this fits. So there's, I read an article the other day about, um, or not an article, this is a, one of these uh, Marxist uh, academics talking about how the power struggle dynamic between parents and child and how that needs to be dismantled uh, even as well. Um, yeah. So they're everywhere, right? They that see it every like exactly day. Yeah, that sounds like exactly something you would read out of the critical theory handbook. So if it's right okay, what is, how does this infiltrate our culture? So a lot of the stuff, and I'm so glad you talked about like pl- platonic and, and traditional theory because I've just sort of, I think most of it, we've just sort of grown up in this culture and we just kind of absorbed this stuff without even really thinking about it. The old, the, like the traditional way of thinking. Uh, and now I think young people and, and uh, old, everyone is kind of starting to kind of like wallow in this Marxist postmodern world and we're, we don't even see how it's affecting the way we think. So what's right. maybe an example of, of, of a way that we're just kind of stewing in this and we don't even know it? I think it's our inability to have a conversation. I think it's our inability to appeal to a formal structure of logic And it's our inability to appeal to objective truths, wherein we can have conversations with people of different political beliefs and maybe come up with a solution that we both can agree on. But right now, both sides or all sides have such competing different belief systems, and they don't even believe in the possibility of compromise or the possibility of objective reality. So just the fact that so much stuff is crazy right now, I mean, that's just the best example. Uh, perfect example. So uh, I, I got to run here, but um, we did a biography on Marx the other day, and Marx's mom, who he hated, did not give him an advance on his inheritance, and he wrote a letter to Engels saying that uh, it's so unfair that his mom places, his family places these hurdles in his way. So the, the idea that she didn't give him money is a hurdle. Is that a very Marxian <laughs> concept? I'd probably say so, yeah give me money otherwise it's the structure that's the problem and we're going to tear it all down amazing uh tyler how did you get so smart i I gotta run but give me like something that we all need to read and learn more about oh god i listen to a lot of youtube lectures i think in this day and age we can't sit down and read because our time is too precious so if you want to get smart you want to learn go on youtube listen to all these great people do lectures jordan peterson is a great guy for all this stuff and uh just listen instead of read i would say 
and it's there for now. So do it while we can. Tyler Brandt yep. uh, from uh, Foundation for Economic Education. Tyler, let's talk again, man. Appreciate you. Yep. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it for having me. Really good. I love that. That was, that was as clear and articulate as uh, perfect. Perfect. True story. It's later. Spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, the reason why we've spent so much time the last two days talking about our education system and the, the postmodernism, the Marxism that's going on uh, clearly, blatantly, and explicitly is to understand the forces that are, that are dividing us. That's the ultimate goal, is to keep us divided, to keep picking at the scabs of our country, of racism in particular, because if, when you pick scabs, they continue to bleed and they can continue to divide. And we have to cut that out. <laughs> Enough of that. And one of the men who's leading the charge to stop that is Vince Everett Ellison. He's got a book called The Iron Triangle. You can get it on irontrianglebook.com. Vince, how are you, brother? Man, I'm doing great. How are you? Good to talk to you, man. What, what's, what's your thesis here? What's your message? Well, um, I, I was born on a cotton plantation in Tennessee, West Tennessee. My father was a sharecropper. And, um, you know, he pulled us out of poverty by getting involved in the insurance industry and you know, I lived a middle-class life and went to the University of Memphis. And uh, after that, I started working in the prison industry in South Carolina in the 90s. And I saw that we were going backward because uh, the Clinton crime bill and the Biden crime crime bill was locking up a lot of black men, just a lot of black men, period. In South Carolina, the prison system, uh, we had three prisons in the 1980s, and by the end of the 90s, we had over 40. So I started asking the black intelligentsia, man, what's going on? Why are these young black men being locked up? Why are, they, why are we going backwards? And of course, they said it was those evil, rich, white Republicans. They're doing it to us. So I resigned my post, went down there uh, into the black community to try to help stop sending men to prison and started to, trying to keep them out. And when I got down there, I found out something pretty interesting. I saw no rich, white Republicans down there. I only saw black Democrats. And what I saw mostly were these three entities. I call them the black preacher, most black politicians, and most black civic organizers. And I call this group the Iron Triangle. And they had a job, and this job was a particular job. They were contracted by uh, rich white liberals to keep the black community in, co in complete control so they could get 90% of the black vote. And they've been doing it very well for the last 60 years. So that's why I call the book The Iron Triangle. I expose who these people are, I expose how they work, I expose the, the history of it, how it came about, and how they operate. And what we can do wow. is stop uh, them. Yeah. What, let, me, let me focus on one of them, uh, the preacher. The Black Preacher. Talk to me about that. Well, it's uh, Gunnar Myrdal was a Swiss, Swiss economist. He wrote a book called The Negro Problem in America back in the 30s. And he went, came to America to find out what was the problem with black people, why we couldn't pull ourselves up. Myrdal talked about the black minister and said that he was created by the slave master. He talked about how the minister's job was to perpetuate slavery and how his job was to keep black people in line for, of course, the master. After slavery, of course, he did the same thing again. So he was, he was taught an apostate religion from the beginning because in the South, it was a false Christianity because this Christianity said that you could keep people enslaved. It said you could rape black women and then sell your children. So the black slave was taught this Christianity and he was taught it from his master and from the black minister. Let's fast forward. 100 years later to the civil rights movement. You got the same thing going on. He's just a pawn in a game to keep black people under control for the white master. Who is this white master? The white Democrat. He always has been. They have controlled the black community since 1800, since their inception. From 1800 to 1860, slavery. From 1860 to 1865, they killed a million people in the Civil War, trillions of dollars worth of damage to keep their slaves. From 1865 to 1965, 100 years of Jim Crow, systematic murder, systematic destruction, theft, rape, looting, you name it. One end to keep the black community under control for them. When they could no longer do it after the civil rights movement, they decided we can't, can't keep them from voting, we're gonna control the vote. And then they went again and got the black preacher and all these other guys and said, we want you to make sure these black people vote Democrat. And they did. And we have never not voted Democrat, except for a small time during reconstruction. After that, the election of 1876, the South went Democrat. And it went Democrat when Confederates could not vote. So who voted Democrat in 1876? It had to be black people and freed slaves. We've always done it. 
It's Stockholm Syndrome, it's cognitive dissonance, and it's love for the master, and it hadn't changed, and it's not going to change until we make it. There's no way, I think Larry Elder said this, there's no way you can have 95% of any group of people vote one particular way without something nefarious going on to going on, and, and just very simply just being lied to. There's no way 95% of a group of people vote one way. Let me ask you this, Vince, because I'm hearing you talk, and, and, and you know, obviously this book, and I'm sure you've been called all the worst things in the, in the book. Right, trainer. Never to my, never, never, never to my face, though. I wouldn't either. By the way, <laughs> you look like you look like a strong, <laughs> a strong imposer. You've been to the gym, is what I'm saying. Let me let me throw this your way. So Larry Elder's new um, uh, documentary called Uncle Tom. He has this scene in yeah, it so. where, yeah. right? And remember the scene? This, this guy and he's talking to his mom on the phone, and he's telling all these facts like like you do in your book and everything. And the mom ultimately said. Uh, well, now you're talking bad about black people. Uh -huh. let, let me ask that first. I got, I got a second part of that, too. But what do you say to that accusation first? Oh, man, look, if you love your people, you got to tell them the truth. If not, what, what good are you? You know, you have to tell the truth. Uh, I'm a Christian. I believe that uh, as an heir of Jesus Christ, I cannot be a victim. How can I be a victim if I'm an heir of Jesus Christ? How can I believe in white supremacy if God is my father? How can I believe systemic racism or that racism has any power over me when Jesus Christ is my father? See, that's the contradiction. They're the ones that have been lied to. And also in our Bible, we say that a tree is known by the fruit it bears. They asked Jesus, you know, Jesus said they will come in my name and they will do great and one wondrous works that would fool the elect. And the disciples said, Lord, how will we know them? He said, by their fruit. He didn't say by their works. He didn't say by what they say. He said, by their fruits. And what are their fruits? Look at the rioting. Look at the look at the looting. Look at all of this. And he said that you cannot get good fruit from a rotten tree, and you can't get rotten fruit from a good tree. So if the fruit is rotten, the tree has to be rotten. Eighty-five percent of black people say that they're Christian. That's what they say. But they vote for politicians that believe in murdering children. The Democratic Party believes in killing children up to the ninth month now. They say they're Christian. But they vote for a party that says that children cannot pray in school or pray to God, but they can give them transgender operations and teach them that, treat, teach them that their gender is fluid. They say that they are Christian. Yet John Locke said in the second treaties of government that we're supposed to preserve ourselves so we can do God's will. That's why we're here. So therefore, we have a right to defend ourselves. And they vote for politicians that take the right that God gave them of self-defense away from them and then tell them that since you're being hunted by the police, you say you're being hunted. You say that the gangs are hunting you. I'll tell you what, the best thing you do is turn in your gun. Why don't you just be expeditious and blow your own brains out? It is ridiculous. The whole concept is insane. Open your eyes, look around you, and understand this. Black people have always been, have always played a large role in their own destruction. I watched the movie Roots as a child, and this is a scene that always bothered me. It was a scene when the uh, slave mother escorted her own daughter to the overseer's cabin to be raped. It was in the movie. The scene where they were beating Kuta Kente with the whip to try to make him say his name was, was Toby, where the slave master was giving the order, but there was a black man with the whip whipping Toby with it. See, it's always been us. You remember the movie On the Waterfront when Marlon Brando told his brother, it was you, it was you, I could have been a contender. Mm -hmm. I could have been somebody instead of a bomb, which is what I am now. It was you. It's always been us, man. It was it's, it's us that tell our children there's white supremacy, there's systemic racism. You can't make it in America. It's us that tell our children that you have no bootstraps to pull yourself up by. It was Martin Luther King Jr. that said, we come to government that 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the Negro is still not free. That is a lie. I was born free. We are the one. It's been the black community that's planted these poison pills into the minds of their children for the last 200 years. And we are going to be the ones that are going to have to change it. White people have nothing to apologize for. It's us. Stand up and be a man and take responsibility for it and change it. Vince, I got 60 seconds, and I hate that. We're going to have to talk again, brother. Uh, I want to ask you, because this ties in and your time in the prison system, this idea of uh, snitches get stitches. Uh, I read a post the other day that 86% of um, uh, murders, or, I think it was murders or shootings, in Oakland go unreported. Mm. What, do we, what do we do about that? And what's the effect that that has on, uh, on these neighborhoods? 
that mentality? Well, there's two things. There's two things we got to do. There's an old Valvillian term that says 98 percent of any gig is just showing up. The conservatives and the Republicans don't show up down there. They don't show up, and you know they don't show up, and I know it too. Also, uh, we as Christians and Jews and Muslims and citizens have to do what the government has refused to do. We've been waiting for the government to do the job that we should be doing. We talk about evangelizing. We talk about going down to Africa and China and helping people where there are people here in America that need help. We have to go back and get our brothers and sisters again. And this is what the Iron Triangle is. It is a primer. You have to first arm yourself with knowledge before you start trying to take on this task. It's a primer that teaches us how to talk to these people that are trapped down in the ghetto. They think that we hate them. They think that we believe we're better than they are. And that's why they don't want to have anything to do with us. We have to show them that we love them. Now, we don't need to apologize. We don't need to repent. We repent to God. We don't need to go down and beg for forgiveness because we've done nothing to them. But as brothers and sisters, as fellow citizens, we do have an obligation to talk to our brothers and sisters and try to pull them back over. And that's what this book talks about. Vince Everett Ellison, uh, The Iron Triangle. You can go to irontrianglebook.com. Vince, you're the man. Appreciate you. Let's talk again, man. We got a lot more to talk about. Man, anytime. I look forward to it. Grateful for you, man. Vince Everett Ellison, irontrianglebook.com. That's a perfect uh, intro to uh, our uh, special tomorrow, which is all about Black Lives Matter and how it's a giant hoax. <laughs> I think you heard uh, a good portion of that right there. Uh, Senator Sanders, have a great rest of your day. See you tomorrow. True story. Spread the word.